Welcome back to Let's Code. I'm Chris Biscardi, and today we're going over the surface for the Learn WGPU tutorial series. Before we get started, I want to go over a couple of the changes I've made since we did the dependencies and the window video. This largely amounts to two changes and one uh, note that I want to make that somebody brought up on the last video. So the first change is that we are using Wasm Server Runner exclusively, which means that I have now set up the index.html file to use the API wasm.js and API wasm wasm URLs, which the currently running server over here on the left is currently serving for us. So if I stop the server and we look at what I'm doing here, I'm using cargo watch with dash X and then using run with a target of wasm32 unknown unknown. And because in car .cargo, this cargo toml or not cargo toml, config.toml under the target wasm32 unknown unknown target, we're using the runner as wasm server runner. And in cargo.toml, you can see that there's no wasm server runner installed at all. And you can see on the right here, if I make this a little bigger, that wasm server runner is a binary that we've installed. So inside of .cargo, where we can set up things like different linker options and stuff like that, we use the wasm server runner binary, which will serve this index.html file for us. And instead of using a third party HTTP server or something like that, when I run cargo watch with the run with the target set to wasm, this will just keep running. We can see that the compressed wasm output is something like 435 kilobytes, it seems, which is pretty big. But the web server has started at this URL, and that's what you can see over here on the left hand side. So I'm going to take this terminal, and you can just, for the rest of the series, assume that I'm always running this wasm server runner server, and that our wasm is being compiled for us automatically. The other major change I made for this uh, index.html is I moved the div with the wasm example ID above the script that pulls in all of the wasm JavaScript. I also moved the style tag into the head because there's no reason to have it in the bottom of the body. So given that the index.html was not well defined in the first tutorial, this is what I've ended up with. Um, and I'll leave a link to the repo in the description. So if you're trying to follow the tutorial, you can use the code that I have uh, come up with here. So the other major change that I've made since the last video is that uh, we are using tracing now. Specifically, we're using tracing wasm for our wasm support. So if we go into lib, you can see that I've removed a bunch of the code that we had before around uh, logging. And you can see that the console error panic hook set once function is being used if we are targeting wasm. And then tracing wasm set as global default is being used as well. Um, and if not, then we set up the tracing subscriber default formatter. And I've included three different sort of log outputs here, info, warn, and error, so that we can see what they look like here on the left. So we've got info, warn, and error. And now we should see all of the potential issues that we may run into. The final note I wanna make is that we spent some time in the last video talking about this ref match here. And if I turn on the inlay hints, you can see that this ref is causing this event to be a shared reference to a window event. So everything I said in the last video is still accurate, but I wanted to show that if we remove that ref, what we get is an owned window event here, and our code still compiles and runs just fine. So I don't know why this ref is here in the tutorial. Um, you can either choose to use it or not. You do get a different value or different kind of type out of it. You either get a shared reference to the window event, or you get an owned reference or an owned type of the window event, but I'm not sure why that was in the last tutorial because it does not affect anything. So if you notice that, good on you. Um, but if you didn't notice that, it's not a problem. It doesn't change the functionality at all. So let's get started with the surface. And by the surface, we will find out what that means in a little bit. So first, some housekeeping state. For convenience, we're going to pack all the fields into a struct and create some methods for it. So in lib.rs, we have to bring in the window struct. We have to create a struct and we have to set up an impl for that struct. If I just copy this, this isn't just pasteable into this lib.rs though. I guess it is if I do it way up here. Okay, so you can see the window struct being brought into scope up here for winit. I am not sure why that's separate or separated out from the other one. Um, so I'm gonna use Rust Analyzer and I know this text is really small here that I just brought up but I hit command dot and it says merge imports. And now with a save, it formats and we can see that the window is brought into this use item so that we don't have multiple win it uh, use items 
Now we define this state here with a number of fields. Uh, the tutorial goes over each of the fields, so I'm not going to do that just yet. But suffice it to say, they are all either WGPU or WinIt types. Then we use impulse state. So impulse state allows us to define functions that are associated with the state struct. In this case, one of them is async. So a very common uh, function to associate with a struct is a new function. So you can do something like state colon colon new and pass in a window and then do some stuff. If you've never seen to do before, to do the to do macro is basically a way of saying this code isn't here yet and the Rust uh, type checker will stop here. But at runtime, if we hit this code, it will panic and crash the program. If we put in a message here, like haven't done this yet, <laughs> It, the message will also print out. So these are basically just a way of saying, hey, we haven't written this code yet, but please Rust, like just pretend the code stops there and don't worry about it. So you'll see that we aren't returning self from these functions, but because Rust knows that the program is going to panic here anyway, it'll just let us panic instead of making us set up all of the code properly. So we've got new, which is async. We've got resize which takes a self argument, mutable self argument, and a new size. So that's a winit DPI physical size, probably something like, actually, I won't guess at what this is yet. I will say that there are DPIs for like printing, which are like 120, 300, something like that DPI. Um, but there are also DPIs for screens. And sometimes you have to have a scaling factor between say like a retina screen and like a 1080p screen. So I assume that that's what that's being used for. Then we have an input function that takes a window event. So something like a mouse event, presumably. We've got this update function, which we'll probably use to update our rendering or update, this, update the state of our rendering anyway. And then this render function that uh, also takes a mutable self-reference and returns this result and uses the WGPU surface error result type or not result type, but um, the surface error error type. So I put those all in just right at the top there and we can go on to the next piece. Um, the tutorial also glosses over these state fields. So it, it seems like the tutorial is going to go in deep and then back back out. So then it provides immediately the entire async uh, new function for us, I think, or maybe a bunch of it, but not all of it. It does look like this is all in the new function. I wonder if there is a way we can just copy and paste this in. Okay, I think that's the end of the new function. So there's actually quite a bit of code to copy paste here. And uh, all of this initial code is going into the new function. So what I'm going to do is leave this to do at the bottom and then I'll copy this code in one by one. So in this case, we are getting the window inner size. We're getting an instance uh, from presumably whatever backend will work. We use an unsafe call here, which is interesting. Um, I don't work a lot with unsafe, but you can think about it as not really as a relaxing of requirements because you still have to like meet the requirements Rust expects. Um, what unsafe means is basically we are telling the Rust compiler that we know how to uphold the constraints that it would otherwise want to check because in this case, maybe it can't check or we don't want it to check. So we are responsible for manually doing uh, things that the Rust compiler would do for us normally when we use unsafe. I'm not terribly concerned about this one in particular because it seems like it's a single function call. And presumably this create surface call on the WGPU instance type is going to be labeled as an unsafe function. And if we go to docs.rs for WGPU, it does seem that this create surface is labeled as unsafe. So pub unsafe function create surface, which takes a raw window handle, which we're passing in here, and it creates a surface. So if we look at the safety constraints, uh, a raw window handle must be a valid object to create a surface upon and must remain valid for the lifetime of the returned surface. If it's not called on the main thread, the metal backend will panic. So we're doing all of our work on the main thread, so that's not an issue for us. And then we need to make sure that the window that we get back from this is a valid window to create a surface upon. Um, and then it must, it must exist for the entire time that we're using the surface that we've created. So this surface that we get back is the surface we've created and the window we've passed in is the window that has to live as long as this surface does. And as long as we do that, I think we've uphold, upheld the constraints here. So then we get request adapter from the instance, which is the 
instance of one of our backends. In this case, it, it could be Vulkan, Metal, DX, DirectX 12, uh, or the browser. So we can think of the instance as like our GPU. So we're asking the GPU for an adapter and we use the WGPU request adapter options to tell it what we want or what we prefer that adapter to look like. We've got power preferences, compatible surfaces, and whether or not we're gonna force the fallback adapter. So let's go and see what the tutorial explains for this code. The instance we just looked at is the first thing we create. Its main purpose is to create adapters and surfaces. The adapter is the handle to our actual graphics card, but we're gonna use that later. So if we look at the options that we were just looking at, the power preference has two variants, low power and high performance. The low power will pick an adapter or like a GPU, for example, uh, that favors battery life. So Intel has integrated graphics. So you could pick the Intel integrated GPU if you were going for low power. High performance is more likely to pick your, you know, 3080 Ti. It does look like WGPU does automatic fallbacks. So if you try to pick one, and then it doesn't exist, um, then it'll fall back to the low power or basically whatever it can find, it seems like. The compatible surface field tells WGPU to find an adapter that can present to the supplied surface. The tutorial still hasn't told us what a surface is yet, so don't worry about that. And then the force fallback adapter forces WGPU to pick an adapter that will work on all hardware. And it seems like there is uh, a software capability built into WGPU as well. So we could end up picking like a 3080 Ti or the integrated Intel graphics or some basically backup plan where if we don't really have a GPU, it, it seems like we could probably do some of the work on the CPU, which probably has significant performance uh, impact, but it seems like it will at least run. There's a note here that basically says um, these options aren't guaranteed to work for all devices. And there are some things we can do to debug that if we need to. So I, we will come back to this, I think, if we have an issue. And there's apparently more things we can do to like refine our search. So if your computer has like multiple graphics cards or something like that, then you might want to use, uh, you know, like one specific card over another or something like that. Which brings us to the surface. The surface is the part of the window that we draw to. We need it to draw directly to the screen. Our window needs to implement raw window handles, has raw window handle trait to create a surface. Fortunately, when it already does this for us, so we don't even really need to care. I probably would leave this out if I was writing this tutorial. The device in the queue. So it didn't really tell us what the surface was. From my understanding, what the surface is, is basically a square on the screen inside of our window that we intend to actually put pixels onto. Uh, we may get a better explanation of that later in this tutorial. So the device in the queue, we get a little bit more code to copy paste, which I'm assuming goes directly below the code that we did before. So here, right below adapter, we paste in more code. And this is using the adapter to request a device and passing in a device descriptor struct. I'm going to lower the example window for now because it doesn't seem like we're actually doing anything with the window. And I'll bring it back up later when we actually want to run the program. So we've requested a device here using uh, some description. This descriptor pattern is really common. Uh, I found in say like Bevy's render engine or rendering pipelines, uh, when we're setting up things like bind groups and otherwise interacting with the APIs that would then go through and touch WGPU. We're not asking for any features, but we are setting some limits. So one of the things that I know is that WGPU is new and not necessarily supported by all browsers at the moment. And the backup that is more widely supported at the moment is WebGL2. But WebGL2 doesn't support everything that WGPU does. So if we are building for WASM in the web, uh, we have to disable some stuff because I believe WGPU targets the WebGPU spec by default. So we use a config flag again. And if we're targeting WASM32, then we set the limits to down level to whatever the WebGL2 defaults are. Otherwise, we use whatever the default support WebGPU has or WGPU has. It doesn't describe what features uh, WGPU would support, which is interesting. It looks like we can log out a list of features supported by our devices, which I feel like would be interesting. So let's take this and below all of this adapter.features um, and I'm just going to info it out. Uh, no, let's debug it out because I don't know what this even returns. I'm going to pull and I'll pull a terminal up real quick and do a cargo run. 
and see what comes out. Of course, this will this should panic. It should hit to do, but it doesn't seem to have, which is interesting. Oh, we never call this function. Dang. Okay. Well, <laughs> we haven't even set this up to work yet. So I think I'll leave this debug in for now, and I'll put a shared reference on this just for future proofing purposes. We'll continue with this because. It didn't give us working code yet, which I'm finding to be pretty common with this tutorial. Um, it just kind of like dumps a bunch of code in a bunch of segments and doesn't give you something that works before doing so. So let's take a look at the features in a different tab. So WGPU features, this on the left here seems to be just a bunch of different flags. And it does seem to give us sort of like a broad overview of what is supported where. So Whatever, whatever a depth 32 float stencil is, uh, Vulkan mostly supports it. DirectX 12 supports it and Metal supports it. And it looks like this works on the web and for native. There are different types of uh, like texture compression or image compression, basically. So in this case, there's a flag for whatever the BCN family of compressed textures is. Kind of hilariously, it just says supported platforms, desktops. <laughs> but also web and native. So I don't know. Maybe you have to test some of this stuff out to see if it uh, is working for you or not. Let's get back to the uh, tutorial. We've got more code here, setting up more config. So I'm going to paste that in under the adapter. This is a surface configuration. So surfaces being the pixels that we're going to render onto the screen. WGPU texture usages render attachment. If the tutorial doesn't explain what that is, we'll go and find out. And then for the format, surface get supported formats from the adapter and just get the first one i assume that we could potentially pick from a set of different formats the size dot width and the size dot height is what we got earlier in the function so it's the window size and then we've got a present mode in this case it is first in first out uh, now the present mode is something related to like v synky type things so here we're defining a config for the surface this will define how the surface creates its underlying surface textures we'll talk about surface textures when we get to the render function okay so we're kicking that down the road the config usage describes how the texture is going to be used render attachment specifies that the textures will be used to write to the screen and we're going to kick that can down the road too i'm not a huge fan of the pattern of bringing something up and then being like we're going to talk about that later not now like if it's if it is important enough to bring up now, then let's talk about it now. Anyway, the format defines how surface textures will be stored on the GPU. Different displays prefer different formats. So we're getting the preferred format that our display wants, and then just setting the width and the height of the window for our surface texture. Apparently setting the width and the height of the surface texture as zero, uh, your app could just crash. So don't do that. <laughs> so the present mode option that we picked, which was first in, first out, caps the display rate to the display's frame rate, which is essentially VSync. This is guaranteed to be supported. Uh, and there are other options, which I'm assuming are things like uncapped frame rate. So auto VSync, no auto VSync, first in, first out, and first in, first out relaxed, immediate, and mailbox. I don't know what mailbox is, no idea. So there's auto VSync and auto no VSync, which look like, um, Options that will pick from a set of fallbacks. So auto vsync does FIFO relax and then FIFO or auto no vsync does immediate mailbox or FIFO. And this seems to define sort of how frames are presented to the screen. So I will leave a link to this down below in the description if you are interested in more about how these frames get presented. It looks like we do get the option to sort of expose these choices to the user, which if you play like say Fortnite or something like that, um, you can set things like the frame rate or the, uh, V sync. And now we set self at the end. So let me just make sure that my curly braces line up here. So all of that's good. And then we configure the surface with the device, which we got from request device and the config, which we set up here is the surface configuration and we return self. So we return the state of all of this stuff. It's really strange to me that we don't have like state new setup yet. Let's see, inside of run, there's the window setup and there's the event loop. And in between those two, we have to set up our state. So in run, there's the window setup here and the event loop here. So I'm assuming it's here, but they don't really specify that very well. Now that run is async, main will need some way to await the future. We could use it to create like Tokyo or async standard, but I'm going to go with the more lightweight pollster. I 
hope they explain why they go with Polster here because Tokyo is like the gold standard for async runtimes. And then the competitor to Tokyo would be async standard. There are many options, but I would love to see in this tutorial, like a, we're using Polster because of X. Like, why are we not using Tokyo? So we can add Polster in here. They specify using Polster uh, 0.2. So I'm just going to use 0.2. I'm not even going to look to see if there's an update. And then in main, we have to block on run. So instead of using run here, we're going to Polster block on run, which allows us to run an async function and sort of block the execution of our program until it returns. Uh, this is kind of a common way of kicking off something like, hey, we're going to kick off a web server or something like that. Um, so you get the main, you basically kick off your async program in runtime, and then you wait until that completes. I think that they didn't. Okay, there it is. So they did make run async, which the, you do need to do. So you'll see that the, if I can find it, the place we just put this state new, because new is async, and we've got this await here, the function that is in that it's inside of does need to be async for that async await to work. So it says if we try to build Blossom right now, it'll fail. I wonder if it will succeed for regular running. So let's do a cargo run and see what happens. Okay, so the window still works. Everything seems to have run without crashing, which is great. Um, we've got our adapter features here, which are all of the things that we just saw from the documentation page, uh, like depth clip control and the texture compression types. So these are, for context, the features that my M1 MacBook Pro uh, supports. You can also see that we've got our adapter up here. So the adapter is metal, which makes sense because I'm on, uh, I'm on an Apple M1 Max using the integrated GPU with the metal backend. So there's quite a bit of info in these debug messages, which is really nice. Uh, when we configure the surface with the surface configuration, render attachment usage, the format we got was a BGRA8 U norm sRGB, which you can think of as a VEC4 of U8s, I believe. No, yeah, a VEC4 of U8, so 0 to 255 um, in the sRGB color space. The width of the window when it started up was 1600, the height was 1200, and the present mode we chose was FIFO because that's the configuration that we chose when we set it up. It says build swap chain surface configuration. I, uh, the swap chain must be related to that last piece that we set up. So surface.configure must configure this swap chain stuff. So we've got a surface configuration with a swap chain size of three. Ooh, yes, actually this is directly related to the FIFO stuff we were just looking at. So if we look at this FIFO again on the docs.rs page, uh, presentation frames are kept in a first in first out queue approximately three, three frames long. So I assume that's what this swap chain is. And that means three frames. The present mode is FIFO, like we just discussed. The composite alpha mode is opaque, so there's no blending going on here. The format is the BGRA8 UNORM SRGB, like we talked about earlier. This is a VEC4 of four U8 values. The extent is sort of the sizing. So you'll see extent 3D if you work with Bevy and you try to create your own image texture or something like that, um, or if you try to work with array textures. So you have to set up an extent 3D to define the width and the height and also the depth or array layers. So in since we're not using multiple depth or array layers, I don't think that I'll go through that. We'll probably come across that again later. Um, I'm going to get rid of this adapter features because I don't need that debug coming out anymore. Um, the one thing that I will say about depth or array layers is that basically you can think of a texture as one giant image. So in this case, a 16 by 1200. Uh, like single PNG or something like that. Or you could think about it as, let's say, um, if this extent 3D were 1200 by 1200, um, or let's, let's keep it as 1600 by 1200 because I can do that math. So if we had a depth uh, or array layers of, say, four, right, we could set the height to be 1200 and the width to be 400. Um, and we could find, kind of have an array of four textures each of which takes up 400 of the pixels that we could then swap between using an index. At least that's how it works in Bevy. So I assume that's how it works here as well. But of course, our Wasm build is probably failing right now because uh, async is not supported with Wasm bind gen as a start method. 
You can switch to calling run manually in JavaScript, but for simplicity, we'll add the wasm bind in features crate to our wasm dependencies as that doesn't require us to change any code. So wasm bind in features, then we go to cargo tumble. We already have wasm bind in features. I feel like that was already set up for us in the last thing that we did. Why are we, I don't understand why we're talking about this again. We talked about this in the last tutorial. Okay, anyway, we already have it, so we're not gonna change anything. If we wanna support resizing our application, we're gonna to need to reconfigure the surface every time the window's size changes. That's the reason we stored the physical size and the config used to configure the surface in, in the state struct is what they mean. That's the reason, so because we're going to resize, that's the reason we stored the physical size and the config used to configure the surface in the state struct. They don't say that here, but that's what they mean. So with all of that, the resize is very simple. Let's go back in. We'll replace this to do in the resize function on the state impl. And then if the new size dot width is greater than zero and the new size dot height is greater than zero. So basically um, if we change the size to zero, zero, remember our program is going to crash. So we can't do that. Otherwise we set the new size of self to new size. We set the width in the config and the height in the config to the new size height and width. So the window sizes, presumably, although we don't access window here. So I assume that we're going to have to, to call this. And then we reconfigure the surface with the new size. We call this method in run in the event loop for the following events. So I guess we have to copy the middle of this and then go find our match. So in this case, notice that there was additional code that wasn't uh, explained to us yet. So we're matching event here. Let's go below this and add these. So resized and scale factor changed are new and we haven't used them in a match before this yet. So we can just add them down here. And both of these call state resize, uh, whether it's the window event resized function or window ascent, <laughs> window event resized event or the scale factor change. So if we moved from like a 1080p monitor to a retina monitor, that would change the scale factor. Now, if we look up here, there's also if window ID equals window ID, if state input event right before match event. So they didn't tell us to do this yet. And they wrap the whole match event in that. So let's let's keep an eye on this because that's code that they didn't tell us to put in yet. Input returns a bool to indicate whether an event has been fully processed. If the method returns true, the main loop won't process the event any further. We're just gonna return false for now because we don't have any input events we wanna capture. Input returns a bool to indicate whether an event has been fully processed. We're going to return false for now because we don't have any events we want to capture. Why are we writing this code if it doesn't do anything is my question. So here we return false, which means that everything here, when we take this if not state input thing, this is the event match. So that goes here, I think. This syntax is really strange to me. Like nested, double nested matches. Um, I think also REST format is having a hard time formatting this. There we go. I can run cargo nightly format outside. So we just, I just reformatted this because we wrapped uh, this in an extra block. So it'll look a bit different. If you've never seen this before up here, cargo plus nightly format means cargo format, which will format all of the files in our project using cargo format or rest format more accurately. And plus nightly means use the nightly branch or not the nightly branch, but use the nightly release of cargo. Um, that's because when I do code on the internet. Um, I have a cargo format that uses some nightly features to make it so that it squishes into the window uh, to an appropriate size that I can make really, really big for you to read. We need to do a little bit more work in the event loop. We want state to have priority over run. Doing that and previous changes should have your loop looking like this. Okay, so this is the state input thing that we saw earlier that wasn't explained. And I think that's all this is. Okay, so we just did that. And then in update, we don't have anything to update. So leave the method empty. Okay, where's update? I, I kind of wish that they had put a comment here anyway. Uh, we'll add some code back here again later. Uh, render, this is where the magic happens. First, we need to get a frame to render to. So let's get a frame to render to. Um, and you can see that the little yellow squiggle lines means that this update function is never used anywhere. So Rust knows that, Rust Analyzer knows that, and that's why it's telling me uh, that there's a little squiggle here. Same thing for this event. So we've got self.surface.getCurrentTexture. So that takes the surface and gets us that like PNG texture that we're supposed to be rendering to the screen right now. So we get the current texture and we put that in output and then we get a view of that texture and we put it in view 
and we need a command encoder to create the actual commands to send to the GPU. Most modern graphics frameworks expect commands to be stored in a command buffer before being sent to the GPU. The encoder builds a command buffer that we can then send to the GPU. So we once again copy this code <laughs> and paste it in here. <laughs> so we've got the output, which is the current texture, the view, which is the way that we're going to like interpret the texture and the encoder, which will set up a command buffer that we can then send to the GPU. A command buffer very likely being literally a buffer that we then send to the GPU. Now we can get to clearing the screen. We need to use the encoder to create a render pass. The render pass has all the methods for actually drawing. The code for creating a render pass is a bit nested, so I'll copy it all here before talking about it. It's a, if, if they're saying it's a bit nested, then it is significantly nested because I feel like a lot of this code is very nested already. Um, okay, so this goes here. And then we have to get rid of one of these so we can get rid of that to do. And this all formats. Why is this in its own block? I hope that's not a tutorial ism for something. Ah, okay. So first things first, let's talk about the extra block. So before we do that, let's, let's take a look at this code and see what it's doing. So we've got a block here that ends there. And all the block does is set the encoder to begin the render pass. Uh, and it, passes in a struct that describes what kind of render pass that we want to create then outside of that block. So anything that we define inside of this block is then dropped at the end of this block. And we take the queue and we submit the standard iter once encoder finish. So let's, let's leave that for the tutorial to explain actually. So submit will accept anything that implements into iter. So presumably encoder.finish implements into iter or not that, but yeah. And then output.present. So let's talk about the block. Begin render pass borrows encoder mutably. We can't call encoder.finish until we release that mutable borrow. Block tells Rust to drop any variables in it. Yeah, okay. So the thing that we're doing here is because if we remove this, we end up with an error right here. And if we uh, run this, we should see cannot move out of encoder because it is borrowed because the encoder begin render pass function takes a mutable borrow. And then we store that in render pass. So as long as render pass lives, we kind of have to have this borrow on the encoder live. So we can't then immediately after that call finish because finish does the same thing. So we put this block around it to say basically, hey, we're going to do this. But at the end of this block, we will drop what we've taken here. So we drop the mutable borrow for the encoder, which allows us to then re borrow it mutably when we have to call finish. And then it doesn't really explain what the last piece of code is doing here. Uh, we basically just finish the command buffer and tell it to send. And then we need to update the event loop again to call the method. So we're going to, it looks like, handle the event redraw requested and the main events cleared events. So let me take this. And it looks like due to this dot, dot, dot that these go below in this event list. So let's go find the events, not the window events, but specifically these events. So outside of that, we go here. And we paste that code in. So when we're matching on the event, when we have to redraw or when a redraw is requested, if we're in the primary window, this is kind of like a, this window check is kind of a hack. We kind of store the original window and we say, hey, if the window that we're processing this event for is the window that we stored the ID for, then we continue. Uh, so we call state.update. State.update does absolutely positively nothing at the moment. So just to be clear. We are calling state.update. Whenever we redraw, we're calling state.update, but it does literally nothing at the moment. Just remember that it's there because whenever we put code into update, it will run. So then we match on state.render, which is where we just put a bunch of our code. And if it's okay, if the render is okay and succeeded, then everything's fine. Everything's great. If we have any set of errors, so in this case, we lost the surface for some reason. If we are out of memory or if we have some other error, then we have to handle those. So if we lost the surface, then it looks like we're just going to resize the surface. If the system is out of memory, so that's the that's your computer. When your computer is out of memory, we can't draw to this. So then we should probably just exit the application. And otherwise, um, if there's an outdated or a timeout or something like that, if we weren't fast enough, I suppose, then we just proceed to the next frame and try to render it. And if we handle the main events cleared, then we request a redraw. And I'm glad we went over that because they don't seem to explain it at all. It looks like we should get a window here if we run. So let's run 
and see our native window. So we get that blue window right there. And we are also down here uh, getting a blue window in our WGPU browser. So our native example is the one right up here, the Winit window. And our web example or a Wasm example is the browser below it, which is great for us because that's the color we should be seeing. <laughs> so you may be able to tell what's going on just by looking at the render pass descriptor, but I'd be remiss if I didn't go over it. Okay, so they are going to actually go over this. Remember, this is the code that we just put in render. So when we begin our render pass, this is this struct, this render pass descriptor. Um, and you can see the color that we've defined right here. So an RGBA, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and 1.0. Uh, in this case, WGPU color seems to be like an F32 or something. So the color values will be from 0 to 1 instead of, say, 0 to 255. So the render pass descriptor has three fields, label, color attachments, and depth stencil attachment. So label, arbitrary label, probably doesn't matter at all for the computer. It's more for humans reading it, reading error messages and stuff like that. The color attachments, which is where the rest of the code is. And then the depth stencil attachment, which is a none. The color attachments describe what we're going to draw our color to, where we are going to draw our color to. We use the texture view we created earlier to make sure that we render to the screen. Color attachments is a sparse array. Sparse means that you can have, say, an array of five values where you have a value for the first one, have a value for the second, then you're missing two values, then the fifth value is there as well. So you kind of get, uh, you're allowed to have gaps. It looks like we're going to use the depth stencil attachment later, but we're not going to now, so that's why we set it to none. So if we look at this in context, uh, the color attachments are going to be an array of render color or render pass color attachments. We use the view, which is the texture view, a resolve target, and some operations. In this case, we load in a clear color that is this color. So the render pass color attachment has the view field, which informs WGPU what texture to save the colors to. In this case, we do save it to the texture view that we set up earlier, which means in turn that things will actually get drawn to the screen. The resolve target is the texture that will receive the resolved output. This will be the same as view unless multi-sampling is enabled. Um, I don't know what multi-sampling is yet, so I'm assuming that that's disabled. And the ops field takes a WGPU operations object. This tells WGPU what to do with the colors on the screen. The load field tells WGPU how to handle colors stored from the previous frame. Currently, we are clearing the screen with a bluish color. Yes, we saw the bluish color. So I don't think we have any information in our texture yet because we are seeing this bluish color come through. The store field tells WGPU whether we want to store the rendered results to the texture behind our texture view. In this case, it's the surface texture that we set up before, and we use true for store so that we store the output. It's not uncommon to not clear the screen if the screen is going to be completely covered with objects. If your scene doesn't cover the entire screen, however, you can end up with something like this. So if you've ever, if you're maybe older and you remember the, um, the way in which Windows, Windows, like the operating system Windows applications, um, when when your windows used to like hang and freeze, you could drag the window around and it would draw the window all over the place before crashing. Uh, that's the same kind of thing that's happening here. In this case, uh, I don't know, there's like a cube in here, a single cube maybe, and it looks like it's getting moved around the screen or something, but we're not clearing the rest of the screen. So wherever the cube was gets rendered and saved. And then if we don't clear it, the next place the cube gets moved will get drawn, but the old stuff will still be there because we didn't clear it. So you end up with like one cube that can create this whole like dragging around scene. Looks like there's some issues that might be with Vulkan, but we didn't use Vulkan. And then we have a challenge. So modify the input method to capture mouse events and update the clear color using that. Hint, you'll probably need to use window cursor move. Uh, are we going to need to use window cursor moved because they want us to interpolate those values as the color? Let's see. Okay. So let's do this. Let's say I'm going to stop this for a second and we will commit what we have here. So that should be up, uh, on GitHub. Of course it will be up on GitHub before you even watch this video. So check the link in the description if you, if you want that. So where's our input method? Input method is here. So if we match on event and I fill the match arms, we get a ton of different options here to choose from. Mouse wheel, mouse input. I, I don't know why it wants us to use cursor moved specifically. Let's check the types of all of this stuff. Let's see, position is physical position F64. 
modifiers, modifier state, mouse input state, button, modifiers. So modify the input method to capture mouse events and update the clear color using that. Hint, you'll probably need to use cursor move. Why do we need to use cursor move? I don't think we need to use cursor moved. I think they want us to use cursor move. Let's do this. Let's take all of these off. So we do have a mutable access to self. So we can do the same kind of thing that we did already. I can think of a number of different ways to do this. One of which could be to like parameterize this clear color. Does it want us to change the clear color specifically? Update the clear color. Yeah. So it seems to me like it wants us to just copy paste this code or parameterize it with a color here. But I feel like render gets called somewhere. That isn't us, right? Actually, it doesn't. So we could pass in a color here. So let's do color here. And I'm going to use color there and take color. Um, it's a WGPU color. So let's make it so that where's the other place we use this um, render here. So in this case, we pass in this random WGPU color. That's the bluish one. And then up here on input. Well, that wouldn't really work, would it? Because we, we do have to call render at other times. So maybe passing this argument in here isn't the best option. I think storing the color on self would be. So let's go back down to render. Let's copy this color out in our state. Let's say color is this. Of course, we can't do that yet. And then state new um, fn new here. And then let's say let clear color equals this. And when we return it, let's call this clear color actually. And then I'll rename it here for clear color. And then this color is what we'll use whenever we need to render. So self dot clear color. And then in input, I really, I don't think we want to do cursor moved, but I guess we can. They want us to use cursor moved. So let's do this. So we've got an X and a Y for position. So let's do this. Let's say self dot clear color equals uh, some color. And let's say that we're not going to handle this event for now, the mouse input event. This is a comma, not a. Um, so let's do let say r equals self dot width. No, self dot size. Self dot size dot width is going to be something like 1600, right? And the position dot x is also going to be that. So I think we want x over so position dot x over this. Are these all not the same types? Is that what's going on here? Cargo run, cargo run. And then they are different types. What types are they? F64 and U32. This number on the right isn't going to be uh, ever bigger for our purposes anyway. It's never going to be bigger than uh, an F64. So let's do RG and this will be Y and height. And then this will be R and this will be G and it'll be bluish. And then we can move our cursor around and see how it changes. So it's constantly rendering as we move it up and down. We can see that it gets uh, more red as it were left and right gets more green. I think, I don't know. <laughs> um, left and right should gets more red and up and down gets more green. Sorry. I reversed that in my head. Um, let's cargo run it on native to see it run there too. So we can see that as the uh, mouse moves, uh, we get different colors on all different parts of the screen. So I think that was the challenge. Um, I think that's why they wanted us to use that specific uh, cursor moved. I think that I personally would have been happier with doing some noise or something like that, but this is fine. It's fine. <laughs> so that's the challenge. Um, I don't know if we're supposed to commit that or not. So if we are supposed to reuse our code in the next tutorial. I'll look ahead and I'll find out if we're supposed to reuse our code in the next tutorial, then I'll make a branch and link to the branch for the challenge that I just did. Um, if we aren't supposed to reuse it, then it'll just be committed to the main branch or something like that. But I hope you enjoyed this, uh, little demonstration of coloring and stuff like that. <laughs> so this is our GPU surface texture rendering to the screen, which is pretty dope. Um, it's taking the cursor position on top of the GPU texture as the R and G values, the B is always 0 0.3 and the alpha is always one. So I hope that this helped you because it was kind of fun for me. I'm having fun. Um, I know this was a long video. If you have any questions, 
leave them in the comments and I'll answer them. And I will catch you in the next video, which I assume is also going to be a long one because these tend to be that way. So I'll catch you in the next one. Have a great day.